Stuart Gillespie, let me introduce Stuart, who is our keynote speaker for this year and opening the conference for us. His core work has always been and remains interdisciplinary, especially between classics, English literature, and European and English literature. The two recurrent points of departure for his work have been Shakespeare and the editing of manuscript translations. Now, Stuart was in 1992 the founding editor of Translation and Literature, which is now the preeminent scholarly journal of literary translation in English. In 2000, he conceived and planned uh, with Peter France, the multi-volume Oxford history of literary translation in English, that's an Oxford University Press publication, co-editing two of the volumes. Now, in the, within our current context, in Shakespeare studies, his large-scale reference text, very, very important text, Shakespeare's books, A Dictionary of Shakespeare's Sources, was first published in 2001, uh, with a second edition in 2016. This was followed by the essay collection Shakespeare and Elizabethan Popular Culture, and he's published numerous independent articles and essays on individual aspects of Shakespeare's reading and cultural context. So as I say, we have a world expert here on this theme of Shakespeare's sources. Thank you, Bill, and um, thanks to all for the invitation to be here tonight. Good morning, afternoon, evening or night, depending on which one is appropriate for you. Um, I have to uh, set up one or two small things and uh, just to make a quick link, I could say that um, there is a close connection actually between Prospero's books and my own reference guide to Shakespeare's sources, um, which as Bill said is, is called Shakespeare's books. During the time I was compiling it, it was going to be called Shakespeare's reading, but someone else brought out a quite different book called exactly that just after I finished it. So I got my publisher to use Shakespeare's books as the title, partly as a reference to Prospero, and it didn't seem to do any harm. A few words first on what I am and I'm not trying to do here in the next 30 minutes. I've been asked for an introduction to the subject of sources, for the works attributed to Shakespeare, and I've been told that of particular interest might be books not available in English at the time, only in other languages, so I'll say something about that. I won't say a lot about any particular sources because the programme for the rest of this event, I think, sets the agenda there with individual sources and, and certain categories of sources like Spanish or Greek coming up for discussion in their own slots. I, I will be trying to introduce some overall ideas and reflections and questions, the first of which is why take an interest in sources at all? I'd say that identifying sources should never be an end in itself, but it can lead to several possible further outcomes. I can see some of the ways it could be related to questions of authorship, and I'll come to that. First, another general question though, um, has source study, or as it's sometimes called, source hunting, which I think is slightly more pejorative, um, has it had its day? It's certainly a long established branch of Shakespeare scholarship, as, as, as Bill said, but how lively is it at the moment? The American critic Stephen Greenblatt once called source study the elephant's graveyard of Shakespeare scholarship. Greenblatt argued that to deal with texts, we need to think more widely about their interaction, his word, with other texts. He meant that we ought to be looking at what are called intertexts and intertextuality and not just sources. For instance, it doesn't seem to help a lot to call Hamlet a source for Tom Stoppard's play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, but the two texts certainly have a close and important relationship. Or um, for other types of thing, there's that old fashioned term analogue for when a work has so much in common with another that it doesn't seem to be accidental, but we, we can't identify concrete points of contact. 
I think overall you could say two things. Um, there are questions about this subject which have to do with the conceptual frameworks we use when we think about it. The language of sources and the language of intertexts imply somewhat different frameworks. But second, you could say that interest in the origins of the works in the Shakespeare corpus is not diminishing, not, not at all. And I'm going to leave those two points hanging. Now to make a start on questions of sources and to some extent questions of authorship, um, I'm hoping you can now see uh, first of the slides that I've got together, which shows the current um, version of the, the cover of my uh, Shakespeare book. This, this is organized by source author, where there is one, and it reaches a total of around 200 entries for sources reflected in the Shakespeare corpus. Now some entries are for groups of works and categories of works, such as chronicle history plays. So the number of individual works is really in excess of 200. And the number would also rise if I'd included sources which weren't in written form, weren't in, in book form, such as plays which could only have been seen on stage. Um, so, you know, 200 entries is only um, the baseline and um, an, an entry for a, a writer with multiple works, of course, will, will add more. So, you know, we're talking in, in the hundreds and well, well over 200. If you wonder how that would compare with other writers of the time, maybe the closest comparison you can do is with Ben Jonson. I won't go into that beyond saying that we know quite a lot about his library because Johnson's markings are found on around 300 books. He was quite a big annotator. What that actually tells us is, is complicated, but that's a very big number of books for anyone to own in this era. Uh, Johnson, of course, is, is known as a particularly learned writer. Incidentally, are there any books with markings in Shakespeare's hand on them? Yeah, well, yeah, there are some cases of books signed with his name, but all are, as you would expect, deeply suspect. For Shakespeare, of course, mine wasn't the only, sorry, mine wasn't the first treatment of this subject, uh, even in modern times. Um, I'm showing the details now of a major older work from 1947, T.W. Baldwin's William Shakespeare's Small Latin and Less Greek, and he had a theory about the spelling of the name Shakespeare, which I forget. This older work, although a very high powered study, was out of date by the time I set out. And for one reason, any study like this obviously has to assume that certain plays and not others belong to the author you're looking at. But 50 years later, ideas of what could or should be attributed to Shakespeare had moved on a lot, and this affected the arguments. Say, for example, we find that play one shows possible use of, say, Aesop's fables. And then we find play two shows absolutely clear use of the same work. Well, of course, if we know that the two plays are by the same writer, then that considerably strengthens the case for Aesop's fables as a source in play one. But by the time 50 years have passed, plays one and two might not be thought to be by the same people anymore. 50 years on from Baldwin's work, roughly when I was setting out, this type of thing often undermined his arguments about sources. Even more so, the idea, which had very little currency when he was working in the 1940s, that different parts of an early modern play were often written by different hands and then 
stitched together. So in other words, questions of attribution, of authorship, can be very important for arguments about sources. Uh, I guess the idea behind this conference is the converse, that information about sources might help with questions of authorship. Um, this isn't my emphasis in this first session, but I'm sure you'll get onto it. Let me make a start on sources not available in English. One field of specialist scholarly inquiry in recent years has been how much our author knew of Greek tragedy. Because of that famous phrase about him having small Latin and less Greek, it's from Ben Johnson's poem at the start of the first folio, isn't it? Because of that, it was traditionally always assumed that Shakespeare didn't know enough Greek to use Greek texts with any ease. Uh, sure, he knows about some Greek tragedies, but there was a simple explanation for that. Many Greek tragedies had been recast into Latin by the Roman poet Seneca, and we know these versions were widely available, were translated into English, and were even performed from time to time, um, not in playhouses, but privately in early modern England. More recently, though, the question has been raised again about knowledge of Greek. Some quite sophisticated arguments have involved intertexts, that is, indirect routes by which knowledge of Greek plays could have travelled. And commentators sometimes start to speak of ghosts or shadows moving around. OK, an Elizabethan writer might not have known anything directly of, say, Sophocles' play Antigone. But Antigone as a character has a ghostly presence in a number of English works or Latin works, and a writer might have picked up something. At any rate, more concretely, Greek tragedies weren't available in English. They hadn't yet been translated. And here we're touching on the subject of translation. The Elizabethan age has been called a great age of translation, and our author can very often be shown to use translations and not originals. There's a particularly interesting case coming up in the slot immediately following when I, th I think Prospero's speech in The Tempest, Ye Elves of Hills, is going to get a, a reading. Now, it's widely accepted that this speech draws, Prospero's speech draws on the current translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses because some of the same vocabulary is used, including those very words, elves of hills. Those words are found in the Arthur Golding translation of Ovid that had been around and was standard um, by the time the Tempest was written. Um, the echoes are so close that it doesn't seem as though it could be accidental. Plenty of other examples will come up this weekend, I'm sure, in which the language of an English translation is found in one of the plays, and it's what we call a verbal echo. But what's unusual about Prospero's speech, Ye, ye Elves of Hills, is that as well as the current English translation by Arthur Golding, um, the speech seems to make use of the original Latin as well, because it uses details that Golding's version happens to omit, such as the species of tree Prospero's, Prospero refers to, an, an oak. Um, see, in, in, in Golding, the word tree is used, but it's not specified that it's an oak. So uh, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that just because an author used a translation, it doesn't mean he didn't use the original. I'll come back to this in a second, but um, I wanted to get down to brass tacks now and ask what languages do we think the Shakespeare corpus implies knowledge of? 
Um, well, it depends a bit on who you're asking because this is contested and argued over. But Latin for sure, some Greek, if only because Johnson says so, and because anyone attending the higher classes in a grammar school would get some, and then some French and some Italian. Let's go a bit further on the French and Italian, which I should point out were never taught in English schools in this era. These weren't languages of learning or languages important for Christianity, like Latin and Greek. They had other purposes, commerce or entertainment, including music. We still use Italian expression marks in music to this day, don't we? There are snatches of French and Italian dialogue here and there in the plays. Those don't prove anything much because a playwright could easily get a bit of help. There's better evidence than that. Let's let me take you back to that expression, verbal echo. Now, it seems far less likely, doesn't it, that you're going to find verbal echoes in an English work of something in French or Italian than of some text in English, because French and Italian words aren't usually found within a passage of English, obviously. But this um, does more or less happen, in fact. And a good example is in Othello. Now, the main source for the Othello story is one of those big collections of Italian tales. The best known is um, Boccaccio's Decameron. This one um, is, is not so well known, uh, went under the name of Giovan Battista Cinzio, as he pronounced it. And its title translates as The Hundred Stories, one of which is about a Moor who lived in Venice. As far as we know, it hadn't been translated into English by the time Othello was written in 1604. It had been translated into French, as you can see from the right-hand side of the slide. The clearest signs that the author of Othello knew the French or Italian version of the tale, or, or both, come in the form of verbal echoes, and these were discovered some years back. Some words and phrases in Othello are unusual in English, but are very closely related to French or Italian vocabulary. For instance, the word acerb, as in acerbic, is not just rare, it's unknown in English at this date. Its first recorded use is in Othello, when Iago, uh, Iago uses it in, in a weird phrase as acerb, as the colloquintida. <laughs> but the word, is, the word is there in the French version of Cinzio's Othello story, in its French form, acerb, and similarly with other words and expressions in the play. So molestation and ocular proof are highly unusual words or expressions for English, but they're there in the French or Italian form of this text. So you can, in fact, have verbal echoes of non-English texts, and they can be revealing. Here with Cinzio, then, we have an example of a work which it seems our author can't have known in English, but knew in French and or Italian. We have no other viable explanation. That's unusual, though. If the Elizabethan age was a great age of translation, then you'd expect exciting new translations to be appearing all the time and readers to be devouring them. And there is some truth in this. And there are certainly plenty of echoes of translations in the plays, some of which will come up before I'm finished. I'd like to turn now, though, in this slightly freewheeling introduction to another question. It's a question of how far members of a Playhouse audience recognised in any given case an echo of an earlier, of another text, but by which I mean recognised an allusion. At one end of the spectrum, we can easily agree that at least some members of a Playhouse audience were expected to register the quotation of Christopher Marlowe in As You Like It, when Marlowe's line from Hero and Leander, whoever loved that loved not at first sight, is used by Phoebe, who in the same breath apostrophizes its author by calling him Dead Shepherd. Dead Shepherd 
now I find thy saw of might, who ever loved that loved not at first sight. Marlowe had very recently become dead. This makes, I think, the only definite reference to a contemporary poet in the Shakespeare corpus. The source here is very recent. Hero and Leander came out in 1598, and we think As You Like it was written in 1599. At the other extreme of plausibility, though, um, here's a, another, um, another text we know Shakespeare used. This is Sir Thomas North's translation of Plutarch, and this too is going to get its own slot later. But I just want to use it as an example of one thing here. The idea that patrons of the Globe might have recognised some of the verbal echoes of North Plutarch in Shakespeare can be safely ruled out when you realise how limited was the circulation of North's work in the period and how difficult it would have been to get access to it for ordinary people. North's Plutarch was available only in the very expensive edition, this lavishly produced folio that I'm showing now. And this edition was intended for libraries, not public libraries, since there weren't any. No, the private libraries of the rich, it's a, it's a luxury item. Ordinary readers would never have got their hands on it. And a playwright is, is unlikely to have owned a copy, although that doesn't mean he couldn't beg, steal or borrow. So these are examples of what an audience could be expected to recognise and what it wouldn't. But of course, a great many other cases fall somewhere between these extremes. And it's very often worth thinking about this, uh, you know, with any given example. Is this something an audience is expected to know? What's supposed to go through the audience's mind? Now, I'll turn to the other side of this equation. What's going through the writer's mind when a writer consciously or unconsciously uses the words or, or some other feature of a source? And this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my time. I said the words or some other feature. Um, other features can be important. And we mustn't forget that nearly all the plays in the corpus have a narrative source for at least some part of their plots and some of their characters. I think this is pretty well understood and perhaps it's not all that distinctive. Other playwrights, many playwrights use narrative sources. I've come back to these from a writer's point of view, but what is fairly distinctive to our author, I'd say, is the way um, particular words seem to resurface, sometimes quite in a quite intensive way from a source text. So I'm going back first here to how particular words seem to pass into and out of the writer's mind. Lots of writers verbally echo their sources in, in small ways, it's what you'd expect. But for a few moments here and there, our author gets much more heavily immersed in a source than is usual. He seems at times to have focused so intently on a page of Montaigne's essays or a page of North's Plutarch that he takes over its phraseology in a more wholesale way. I'm thinking of passages like this one. It's uh, on the right hand side, Gonzalo's description of an ideal commonwealth. And it draws very closely on the left hand side on Montaigne's essay of the cannibals. Uh, I won't work through these passages, but um, I hope that you can take them in whilst I slow down a little for a few moments. Everyone accepts this, um, this passage of Montaigne as a source here in the Tempest. 
and the English translation, which Gonzalo's words echo, as you can see, is John Florio's, which creates further possible biographical connections, if you know about the suggestions that Florio and Shakespeare were acquainted. But more um, about the mechanism of these more wholesale borrowings. Another example I could have given you is um, better known, I think, Ina Barbus's description of, of Cleopatra on her barge, which draws really heavily on um, a passage in Plutarch's life of Mark Antony in North's um, translation. Now, that one, I think, is understandable. I mean, it's, it's understandable if we find that the author of Antony and Cleopatra was consulting North's Plutarch Mark as he wrote the play. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's an obvious source to check out, isn't it? If you're writing a play about Antony and Cleopatra, here's a life of Antony. Although I think there is still a bit of explaining to do as to how a playwright would have managed to get his hands on this expensive folio. But okay, Plutarch is an obvious place to go if you're writing this play. With the Montaigne, though, it's much harder to see why any consultation would have been going on. Montaigne isn't at all an obvious source for a discussion of an ideal commonwealth. So why would you have a copy of Montaigne open in front of you when writing this scene in the temples? This case then could suggest the operation of memory rather than the use of an open source book. I mean, it could suggest that the author of, of The Tempest had a very retentive verbal memory. And this was a passage that for some reason had interested him in, in Montaigne, in Florida's translation of Montaigne, interested him or, or mattered to him, and he'd internalized it. Okay, these two examples then involve the verbal texture of a passage. But I said I'd come back finally to narrative sources, sources for the plot of a whole play or one of the plots of a play. Here, a different hypothesis looks to be needed about what's going on and how the author is working. And it certainly isn't from memory. I'd like to finish up with something on this. The idea has often been canvassed that to acquire plot material, Shakespeare's procedure was to skim some very sizable works, such as Plutarch's Parallel Lives or Hollinshead's Chronicles, via the marginal notes which summarize the narrative. Here's an example of just a page from Hollinshead's Chronicle. Um, it's um, a page from the reign of Henry VIII. And you can see how the marginal notes give the reader a, a guide to the full text. I'm afraid they're too small to read, so I'll, I'll have to help. Um, some simply tell you where you are. Uh, one, um, most of the way down the left-hand side, simply reads, the Battle of Agincourt. And when the battle is over, another one, um, towards the top of the right-hand column, reads three graves that held 5,800 corpses. So these are simply salient points in the main text. They don't themselves tell a story, they're, they're not enough to, to, to do that, but they point you to something you might want more on from the main text. You see that Hollinshead's page has two columns, that's going to be significant. Here's an opening in Norse Plutarch. Norse Plutarch, um, this is two pages with one column each. So that's a bit different, but it's again, it's got the marginal uh, notes. Okay, back to Holland's head. It seems surprisingly easy sometimes to reconstruct how a book was read, how an author used the source. King Richard II reigned for 22 years, 
all of them, of course, covered by Hollinshead's Chronicle. The play, Richard II, deals only with the final two years of the 22-year reign. However, it also refers to some details of events earlier in the reign, all of them found somewhere in the 85 double column folio pages, which Hollinshead's Chronicle devotes to the first 20 years of Richard's kingship. So did the author plow all the way through these pages or just skim? Altogether, 16 passages in Richard II contain details from the earlier part of the reign as narrated by Hollinshead. Now you have to stay with me for the last couple of minutes. Five of these 16 passages have a marginal note. Okay, so that's what we might expect. The, the playwright is skimming the notes and on five occasions finds something he can use. Then he reads what the full text says at that point. But that leaves 11 other times, 16 minus five, when he uses something from the 85 pages preceding the play's action, when it isn't signalled by a note. So does that mean he read the whole thing after all? It seems not. And the way we can tell that is by the position of these passages on Hollinshead's page. Nearly all of these occasions, nine out of 11, the incident the play uses is mentioned in the lower half of an inner column. That's these bits. <laughs> if you've got the book open in front of you, nine times out of 11, the bit that's getting used comes from the bits that are, are visible here and not the rest. So um, this represents only a quarter of the whole thing. You know, you only need to browse a quarter of those 85 pages. This suggests that the author of Richard II followed this procedure. For this chronologically earlier material, he looked first at the marginal notes. If he found something he could use there, he used it wherever it fell on the page. If he drew blank, he then looked at that part of the tall, four column opening which was nearest to his eye and when as in these nine cases he found material he could use there he troubled no further with these two pages this process would have been relatively quick to read the 85 pages in full would obviously have taken at least four times as long it all seems to add up we could refine on it perhaps we need to imagine reading by candlelight depending on where the candle was placed, that might discourage the perusal of the upper part of each page. It might be more in shadow. But in any case, this type of analysis, inferential analysis of physical reading practices is very little exploited in the study of how sources are used and how plays get written. So I'd like to see more of that and I hope to do a little more of that myself. But um, there's uh, no time to go further here, so I'll stop at this point. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Stuart. Uh, it's fascinating and sets the theme up perfectly for the rest of the conference. I have to say, I've been looking in the chat and people are fascinated by uh, this methodology that you um, speak of really really intrigued one very nice comment it's amazing what can be reconstructed with a sound method which um is a very very uh, accurate comment i would say um now uh, we have some questions coming in as well i mean to, to kick us off and please do not for a moment um think that any of these questions are trying to set you up or you know trying to push you in a certain direction but I did know while you were speaking uh, a number of times you said our author. Now, are you, are you saying that for the benefit of the audience in this particular conference, or is there, you know, are you using? Are you, is that how you generally use uh, the description of the author as you proceed through your practice? 
Oh, I, I suppose I, I was trying to be neutral or, or, or non-committal. Um, I mean, it, it is, of course, um, as, as I said early on, um, it is the case that um, the authorship, the attribution of um, quite a few of the works that used to be thought to be by Shakespeare has, has moved on, has changed. So I was simply using our author to mean, you know, whoever it is behind these works that we're talking about. Right. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so there's a question here from Earl Schauman, actually. He's one of our speakers tomorrow. He says, are the North Plutarch marginal notes based on Amiot's French translation or were they North's original notations? Uh, now, I'm, I'm afraid um, I, don't, I don't have um, a certain answer to that. I, I'm pretty sure that um, they're... they're not taken from the, the French, but I would have to, you know, take no time, would it, to quickly have a look at um, the French text to see. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that they come in with um, with, with Hollinshead, but um, if you used, you know that um, website's called Gallica, which uh, gives you free access to the holdings of the Bibliothèque Nationale Française, um, a quick look there will establish the, the answer for certain wouldn't it? Great, thank you, thank you. Um, interesting question here. It's it's a perennial question in the authorship um, issue, but uh, it says, um, this is from ja Jan, you mentioned Othello having been written in 1604, if I heard you correctly. Can you tell us what source gives 1604 as, as the year of writing? for Othello? Oh, um, no, I can't. I mean, I, I, I don't, um, I, I don't uh, intervene in these, these, these dating discussions. I, I simply, uh, I simply look at um, parameters and consensus. Yeah. And, um, you know, if, if, um, if, if it works, then, uh, you know, according to what other people think, I will accept it. Right. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't have a, a particular um, source for 1604, but um, you know, it is actually part of the evidence. I would think that um, um, it, sorry. It, I, I would imagine that um, evidence evidence varies when you say date of writing. That's normally not distinct from date of first performance, because, as we know, of course, plays were performed pretty much as, as soon as the ink was dry. <laughs> um, so I wasn't trying to make any distinction between date of writing and date of performance. So normally, you know, if we do have a record of an early performance, that's good enough for me. Right. OK, fantastic. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from Carol P. I, I don't know if you've extended um, the search. Are there are the marginal notes used by other authors, for example, Marlowe and Edward II, and so on? Um, well, I haven't worked on on Marlowe in this in this way. Um, right. there's, there's no reason you couldn't. Um, I, I think. I mean, there's a general point here, isn't there? That um, Shakespeare has been worked on so intensively by, by so many um, scholars and critics over the years that there's simply more has been, been discovered about him <laughs> than about other writers. So this becomes a bit tricky when you say, well, you know, we know of so many hundred sources for Shakespeare, but we only know of you know, 50 for Marlowe. If that were so, I'm not saying it is, but as you know, if that were so, then it might only prove that more time has been spent on Shakespeare than, than on Marlowe. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that's a good, a good suggestion, I think. Um, it's, uh, th there's no reason one couldn't uh, do, do a similar uh, piece of work on, on Marlowe, and it, it'd be very interesting to get the result. It'd take some time, though. Right, OK. Um, I'm going to ask you this. I don't know if you've got any idea or a view on it, indeed, but I'll ask it anyway, because it was one of the first questions that came in. It's from Richard Wildman. Uh, does do, do you agree that an, the adolescent Oxford might have written the Golding translation of Ovid? Um, 
I'm afraid I, I don't have a view. I mean, yeah. I, I, okay. I, don't, uh, I don't work on Golding or, or Oxford or anything like that. I, I, I've, I've only really thought about Golding as, as a source for Shakespeare. All right, okay. Um, very direct question here. When, when, will, when will a new expanded edition of Shakespeare's books be out? Now, it came out, you did a second edition in 2016, I believe. Mm. Is that it? You're going to leave it there? or? Well, um, it, it depends a bit on the publisher, I suppose. Um, it, it has sold pretty well, and they wouldn't have asked for a second edition if that hadn't been the case. Um, so I suppose I'll, I'll wait for the call and see what happens then. But um, one thing I would say is that um, it, was, it was a devil of a job to do the second edition for one reason, that the publisher specified that the overall length should be the same. Right, so every every time I wanted to update it by adding something new, and of course, in the course of fourteen years, there had been new material to put in. I had to take away something <laughs> from from the first edition. It's, it was hellish. Yeah, yeah, that sounds hellish. And were there was there anything in there that um, through reaction uh, from readers? turned out to be quite controversial or was it generally accepted as 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 so well you, you've got to remember that um not a whole lot of originality is being claimed for that book not by me anyway um it's really a guide to what people have already said it's a sort of synthesis and a sort of um, um conspectus of you know existing scholarship um, so I don't claim to make any new discoveries. There actually are a few, but they are very small and tucked away. <laughs> yeah, okay. So no, I wouldn't have expected. To, I wouldn't have expected to generate controversy. Great. Okay, Stuart. Well, um, once again, thank you so much for setting up uh, the conference in such um, a perfect way, if I may say. And you've touched on any number of things that will be being touched on um throughout the the two evenings uh, please feel free if you wish to to go back through the chat and the q a and um have a look at all of the comments and um if you feel like answering anything else then uh in the text then please do um but for now i just want to say a massive thanks to you and of course you are uh, more than welcome to stay with us for the rest of this evening and for tomorrow evening indeed if you if you so wish um, Stuart, thank you so much. Thank you, and I, I do plan to take in some of the uh, sessions coming up. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Before we introduce the next speaker, we're actually going to have um, our two actors reading uh, precisely the uh, one of the um, texts and one of the passages that Stuart referred to, and we're going to have passages from William Golding's translation of the Metamorphosis, read by Annabelle, Annabelle Leventon. And we're going to have that show how it, that was then dramatized in one of Prospero's speeches um, in Tempest. And that's gonna be read, of course, by Mark. Annabelle, Mark, over to you. Ye elves of hills, of brooks, of woods alone, of standing lakes and of the night, approach ye everyone. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes and groves. Through help of whom the crooked banks, much wondering at the thing, I have compelled streams to run clean backward to their spring. By charms, I make the calm seas rough and make the rough seas plain and cover all the sky with clouds and chase them thence again. And ye that on the sands with printless foot to chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him when he comes back. By charms, I raise and lay the winds and burst the viper's jaw, and from the bowels of the earth, both stones and trees do draw. By whose aid, weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the noontide sun, called forth the mutinous winds, Whole woods and forests I remove, I make the mountains shake, and even the earth itself to groan and fearfully to quake. 
the strong based promontory have I made shake and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar graves at my command have waked their sleepers oped and let them forth by my so potent art but this rough magic I here abjure. <laughs>